Welcome to Journeys with the No Schedule Man, exploring authentic stories of personal growth and lessons learned from people living true to themselves with creativity, passion, and purpose. For all past episodes, subscribe on iTunes or visit NoScheduleman.com. And please, connect, share, and contribute with a comment, rating, or review. And now, here's your host, the No Schedule Man, Kevin Ballmer. I've been known to struggle with reality. It's not that it is any real mystery. The question this week is, are you ready to reclaim an authentic human connection with friends, with neighbors, with strangers? What about with yourself? Welcome. I'm Kevin Bulmer. This is Journeys with the No Schedule Man, helping to create positive change by exploring and sharing authentic conversations on personal and professional growth. You can find all the past episodes of this podcast around the world on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, and at noschedulemanpodcast.com. If you're in the United States, you can find us on the U.S. feeds of iHeartRadio and Google Play Music. If you'd like to continue the conversation with me on a daily basis, I'd love that, and I invite you to join me in my exclusive online community. It's called The Turtle Tribe. I recently asked a few of its members to describe what they think it is, and here's what one of them said. She said, The Turtle Tribe is a place of unrivaled empathetic support, encouragement, guidance, and mentorship to assist in achieving living life on your own terms among a group of like-minded, inspirational people who are also on a journey to live life to the full. If that sounds appealing to you, please visit theturtletribe.com. You'll learn everything you need to know there, and we would love to have you. Now, back to the question where we started, about reclaiming an authentic human connection. That's the mission of our guest today, Joe Beckman who visits educational settings all around the world in an effort to encourage us all to reclaim human connection. It's Joe's feeling that our schools are experiencing an unprecedented shift and that student loneliness is at an all-time high while self-worth and feelings of belonging are at all-time lows. Joe feels the culprit is lack of human connection. I'm pretty sure I agree with him. And I would say not just connection with each other, but with ourselves. Joe's story about his own journey and the handful of experiences that he had the time to describe in this episode are sure to strike a chord in some fashion. Joe is is one who is out there every day. He's actively engaging with and hearing the stories of students and educators and the challenges that they're facing each and every day. And interestingly, it sounds to me a lot like the challenges that I know many of the people who I consider to be my peers in the middle age are also facing. So I was really interested to hear what Joe's perspective was and is about what he sees out in these communities every day and from these people, and also what he's able to reflect back from his own experience and journey as well. Among the things that really stood out for me from this conversation with Joe included, number one, energy versus talent. Joe tells a really interesting story about where he was first introduced to the idea of how important energy is, how people want to be around others with good energy, and how that can overcome a lot of other perceived limitations, such as talent that maybe has not yet been developed to its fullest extent, (laughs) or maybe is absent altogether. But listen for Joe's story about Robbie Robinson and what he was told about energy. It's something that we could all keep in mind. People want to be around other people with good energy energy. And the reverse, of course, is also true. Number two, the trap of trying to talk your way to a solution. Joe shares a rather touching story of what a student shared with him and how he now wishes he had handled the moment differently. I would love to tell you that I would have been more predisposed to keep my mouth shut and listen than Joe said he was in that moment. But I confess this is a lesson that I'm still actively trying to learn every single day. And it's this. Sometimes the best thing that we can do when we're really trying to offer a compassionate and safe space for others is to just close our mouths and listen. So often we fall into this trap. It's an easy one of trying to talk our way toward a solution. And sometimes the best thing to do is to just stop talking and to just listen. Number three, 
go big with this moment. That's something that Joe says in this conversation and that he said to himself, go big with this moment. And more specifically, when Joe describes that moment, he said it was when he felt like his five-year-old self, five-year-old Joe met 18-year-old Joe, where he was at the time of that moment where he told himself to go big. And, and, And as he described that, In the conversation you're about to hear, I immediately reflected back on times when I felt like I had rediscovered and reconnected with an authentic part of myself that I'd perhaps forgotten or lost sight of in my quest to fulfill all my worldly (laughs) adult responsibilities. It's the, The feeling is it's an electric, visceral experience when you reconnect with who you really are or even just a part of it. And I think that if we can remain open to that, embrace and then act upon it, Our positive energy becomes almost unstoppable. But sadly, many of these moments, they go either unrecognized or they're just allowed to pass by unattended for a variety of reasons, the least of which being that I think we seem to have this idea of what it means to be a, quote, responsible adult. I might suggest that a key part of that responsibility is recognizing those moments when you're reconnecting, when it's time to go big, as Joe describes. Listen for that moment as he describes in this upcoming conversation. You're going to love that story. I've got to say, I'm truly amazed at how this network of authentic, compassionate, and positive people just continues to expand one week after the other with every single conversation that we have in this podcast. And if you're listening to this, I'm assuming that you are actively exploring ways to reconnect with your own true self so that you can do your best work and live your best life. The same that I'm trying to do. No, I want to encourage you to please keep at that. Keep your heart open and just keep taking whatever little step forward you can because they all add up. For more proof of that, I invite you to sit back and enjoy the story of Joe Beckman on Reclaiming Human Connection on Journeys with the No Schedule Man. Joe, what's your first memory of realizing that you were really fully aware of what your mission now is? I'm going to tell you this, and it's not going to sound like real life, but it is 100% an accurate statement. Um, Kevin, I knew this when I was five years old, and Mm -hmm. obviously I didn't know what it actually meant in its full sort of manifestation, but I can tell you that there was a moment, and... Again, it's like, you know, sometimes we have these moments in our lives where they stick and they're memories that, for whatever reason, don't go away. I kind of call them spark moments. Um, And I think that's the universe kind of trying to tell us something, that these moments are important. And I think they happen a lot of times in our lives. And it's just whether or not our eyes are open um, physically and from a metaphorical standpoint, our hearts are open to receive those sparks. And uh, when I was looking back, I remember thinking five years old, I was in the grocery store with my mom. She would take me, this is like my kindergarten year, right? I, so I, would, I was kind of her final child of three. And so I would go everywhere with her. And there was a lady that um, my mom would always go to in the cashier aisle. And her name was Patsy. And Patsy was probably 80 years old and probably didn't need to be working there anymore, but was there because she really, truly loved the job. And she loved the people. And there was always a longer line in Patsy's aisle than anybody else's. Um, And it's because she was who she was. And I remember noticing that as a five-year-old. And I remember Patsy talking to people as she was in line. And then every once in a while, she would see me. She would see me in line. And she would stop in mid-conversation and look at me as if she was seeing the rock star she had always been wanting to meet her whole life. She, Her mouth would get big, her smile. And she would emotion for me to come over to her and I would walk behind all these people and go behind by the cashier, you know, area, which I thought was amazing. And she got down on the knee and she gave me a hug every time. And she would look in my eyes and she would say, Joey Beckman, you are special. There's something special about you. And maybe she said that to every kid that came through, but it felt like she said it to me. And there was a moment there where I knew I just I knew that there was something inside of me that wanted to do what Patsy did for me in that moment. I wanted to do that for other people. And obviously, again, that was probably a mere thought at age five. But as I grew and as I went through my life, I 
had more of those spark moments throughout. And eventually, because I'm not the brightest bulb on the tree, it took me a long time, but eventually I started putting some of those sparks together. And uh, lo and behold, it turned into uh, a career of speaking. And um, I'm lucky to say that I get to do this work every single day. What are some examples that you can share, Joe, of, of other sparks that you recognized of, of that idea of having something special about you and wanting to really nurture reclaiming human connection? What are some examples of some of those sparks that kept at you? So I was a senior in high school when one of the most amazing things happened to me, and that is the fact that Robbie Robinson, who is a nationally renowned gospel singer, had somehow contracted uh, a gig with our high school. And I remember not really knowing anything about gospel music at all. I still don't, but I remember it being a very big deal to a lot of other people, including our administration, because they were like dead set that he was going to sell out the theater and it was going to make a lot of money. And so it was a big deal. And I remember Robbie saying to our administration or somehow the word got to all of us that Robbie had asked for a choir a student choir to back him up. That was kind of his deal when he spoke in schools or saying in schools. And uh, so our administration, not wanting to miss out on the opportunity said, sure, no problem. Except for the fact that uh, I went to a small Catholic school and we didn't have any choir put together at all. In fact, it was an all male, like military Catholic school. So it was kind of an, an interesting high school to say the least. And so we had to scrape together this backup choir which was like not very good it was like bad news bears choir and <laughs> i remember they'd asked me do you want to do it and i said no but then i remember i they told me i could get eighth hour off for an entire week and a half as we went to rehearsals and i was like yes i will go and in walks on day one robbie robinson and he is mammoth like he is he's a huge man like literally like physically he's giant um and he's got this deep voice and i remember him saying students if you're going to be in my choir with his deep voice, right? He said, you need to know it's not about talent. It's about energy. People connect to your energy, not your talent. And he talked about the importance of caring about what you were singing about and to the people you were singing it to. And I just remember that sticking because the night of the concert rolls around and he has the entire place like packed and he delivers the concert of his life. Like two hours of straight amazingness. The people are clapping. They're up, they're up on their feet for the final song, which is This Little Light of Mine. And he sings it, and everybody's singing it, and the choir's singing it. Um, and he gets to the end, and unbeknownst to any of us, he turns around and he starts pointing out individual kids to come down and sing a solo. And, of course, he picks, you know, the rock stars, right? It, he found Garrett Glazer. He came down and nailed it. Rob Lakey came down and nailed it. And then he has a few more kids come down. They all nail it. And then he indicates to the crowd that he's got time for one final soloist. And to my shock and utter horror, <laughs> Robbie Robinson turns around and he makes eye contact with me. And I remember thinking, oh, dear Lord, but you don't say no to Robbie Robinson. And so I just started walking. In fact, I think I was just like levitating like towards him. And I just remember somewhere between riser and Robbie, I said in my head, like go big with this moment. And I treated that crowd to the loudest, most robust, most out of tune version of this little light of mine that they had ever heard. And lo and behold, they loved it. I got a standing ovation. Well, technically they were already standing, but in my head, it was a standing ovation. And ab afterwards people were coming up to me, Joe, that was great. Blah, 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 awesome. And I'm just on cloud nine. And that's when Robbie pulls me aside himself. And he looks in my eyes and he says, son, you are not a very good singer. I, said, <laughs> I know. And he said, but you have energy that can change lives. And I said, I know. And it was like, boom, five-year-old Joe meets 18-year-old Joe. And there was this spark. And I just went like, oh my gosh, this is what I need to be doing. This is like what, I don't know what that means, but a stage, an audience, energy, not talent. I can do that. And so I, I studied in college when I went to college against my Catholic mother's better wishes. I studied uh, theater. That was my th uh, theater. I remember she said to me the first time, what the hell are you going to do with a theater major as a supportive Catholic mother? And I said, I don't really know, but I just know I need to be doing it. And four years later, I had this acting degree. I started doing commercials and things up here in Minneapolis and some stage work 
Um, but I still knew that I was missing something. And uh, I don't know if there was like a real spark moment, but there was a moment when I had an opportunity to work for an organization that spoke in schools every day. And I interviewed, I got the job. And for 12 years, I did that. I went to a different school in a different city in a different zip code every single day. And I led these six hour experiences like retreats that was like music and small groups and live talks and fun games, like all kind of wrapped into one. Um, and it was about three years ago when I started to get the, the urge to step out on my own uh, and, and not speak somebody else's message or this nonprofit's message that I was working for, but to speak my own message. And I'm sure there were some spark moments in that that allowed me to step away or allowed me to get the idea to step away because three years ago I did. And it's been, you know, ever since then up to this point, I've been trying to create my own message and my own brand and just my own way of doing things. Um, and so I'm a person who believes strongly in those spark moments and to, to notice what's around you. And most importantly, to say yes to it some in some way, shape or form, whether that's diving in feet first or just kind of dipping your toe in the water to somehow lean into that, sort of moment where your heart and your soul and your gut all say the same thing. This is important. So I'm envisioning while you're sharing this story, Joe, <laughs> Robbie Robinson is sort of like a friendly Darth Vader. When you do, when you do the voice, Oh, Joe, <laughs> you're not a very good no nah, that don't sound like Darth Vader at all but it's it, it it's just it's it's funny that idea of of bringing people together and somebody else showing you um sort of shining a light back onto you like what that Luke Skywalker character is to get tied into that I just I don't know for whatever reason I heard Darth yeah. I heard Darth Vader when you were doing the voice but that that moment that spark you said about when the 5 year old meets the 18 year old and all of a sudden you realize how closely connected they are and something gets reawakened inside of you. What's it like to be on the Robbie Robinson side of that now when you are uh, working with a, a group of young people uh, and either as part of the, the group experience or when they come up to you and you have a one on one interaction and you see that spark of connection inside themselves. What's that like? I could honestly get emotional talking about it. Like, and again, I say all that because I feel like anybody in the, if I'm listening to this, I could be like, come on, dude, really? But like, it, it is, it is simply the most important part of my job. I can stand up in front of a stage or in front of a crowd and give a 45 minute talk, a 60 minute talk, a 90 minute talk. But that 30 second conversation that I have one-on-one -on -one with a kiddo afterwards who waits in line, who misses class, who, is late to extracurriculars or whatever, because they want to have a conversation with me. That's the most important conversation I'll have that day. I have had breakthrough moments with kids. Um, I've had, I've had moments where I, ha I haven't even said the right thing where I feel like I totally messed up. Um, I've had moments where, um, and again, I'm not trying to be over the top, but I feel like there's been moments where lives have been saved where that small conversation that I had with somebody literally was the conversation that that kid needed to have before he did something or she did something drastic to themselves. Um, and they, they've said it as much, but I, even if they haven't said it, I've known it in my gut. Um, it's a part of the job I take really, really, really seriously. Um, and I, it's like a sacred, sacred part of this work that when a kid comes up to you afterwards and unloads, like some of the hardest things about their life with you, um, it's really important. It's important because, sorry, I'm, I'm getting a little more. Um, it's important because those moments matter. Those could be spark moments for, like you said, those could be spark moments for those kids. And I, I just know how impactful those were for me. And I always say when I'm, when I'm talking to kids and they'll ask me, I started doing Q and A's at the end of my talks and they're the most fascinating thing. And a lot of times I'll get asked, how did I, um, or why did I get into this work? And I tell them to be completely honest is because 
I was a really good kid in high school who needed one good speaker to make him a great kid. I was the kid who was nice to everybody, but never stood up for anybody. Never, never went out of my comfort zone to really truly improve somebody else's life. Um, and I know that kid is in the audience. I know a lot of those kids are in the audience. And I think if we can just get those kids over the edge, just to give them that little extra nudge so they can level up their leadership or their life or their impact, I think that's when we can really, really make a huge change. And I think going full circle that sometimes that extra nudge is the conversation that I have with them afterwards, that little extra encouragement, that little extra, I see you, I notice you, I find those kids, I see them and I'll go up to them and I'll look at them and I'll say, dude, I need you to know that you have a lot of power in this class. And there's a lot of people who are looking at you and your words more than others, for whatever reason, have impact. And I need you to use those in the right way. And, and sometimes I probably don't find the right kid, but I think a lot of times I do. Um, and so sometimes I create those spark moments on my own because I know that kid won't come up and talk to me themselves. But sometimes it's just in the authentic, real, vulnerable conversations that I have with students afterwards who do want to have a conversation. But to answer your question um, in a few sentences, it's amazing. It's important. Um, I, it's an honor. And uh, I, I hold it as like really, really sacred space. And we're talking about human connection here and specifically in the work that, that you do and have been doing for 15 years or more, reaching out to young people. And one of the things that I'm big on, Joe, is I look at change, if I can use that word, which is you could just sort of swap that out for growth <laughs> or life. <laughs> we're here, we're right. trying to grow a connection as a process instead of an event where I think that so much in life we're, we're looking for things in, as an event, a fix, a solution, a pill, a map, a, um, an, an answer, whatever it might be. So I'm curious about from your perspective, maybe an example that comes to mind, if one does at all, yeah. where the event might be you show up and you deliver a speech, some people or an interactive experience, all of what you do, some people come up to you afterwards for a little bit of one-on-one. -on -one. Some people don't. What about an example of somebody that you maybe didn't get the impression that you reached so much or wasn't ready for it that day or wasn't really particularly engaged? But then a year, five years, ten years later, all of a sudden an email shows up or you run into somebody at another event and then the conversation happens. This is the process part of it of you I, I you came to my school at X amount of time and I didn't get it then, but I, I think I do now and here's why and why I want to share that with you. Anything come to mind that fits that wrapper? Too many, uh, probably, to share in a podcast episode. So maybe we'll have to have a second version of this. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm really kind of racing between two strong stories, and I'm, I'm going to share. Um, it's like A or B. They're both really, really impactful, and they both fit the the bill. But I'm going to I'm going to share the one uh, from three years ago. I was in Sun Prairie, Wisconsin, which is a city right outside of Madison, and they had me come in to speak to their entire eighth grade group. Um, and in that eighth grade group, there's probably 800 kids. So it was four different talks with about 200 kids each. And I remember that day being really nervous, more nervous than ever, because um, I had just gotten out on my own at this point. This is really kind of the first crack or one of the first cracks I've had outside of this nonprofit that I used to work at outside under their safety and that umbrella and the format that they did it. And I'm trying new things and I'm trying new messages and I'm trying new jokes. Some of it's landing, some of it's not. And I don't know, maybe seven or eight minutes into my talk, the doors open up in the back and I see the principal escorting a young woman into the back of the auditorium. And for if you weren't <laughs> paying attention, uh, then maybe you would have missed it. But anyone with like half a brain could predict that going to hear a motivational speaker in the auditorium was the last place this girl wanted to be. She had bright blue hair. She had her hood up. She had her earbuds in. And I remember any time I looked back into the audience or in the back of the house to see what she was doing, um, she was checked out. 
And I thought, man, there you go. Like you can't win them all. And of course, because it's a new talk and new ideas, I'm judging myself and I'm in my head. And uh, I was just like, you, you know, like I felt even more stress in that moment. And uh, the talk ends and all's good. And I'm, I'm shaking hands with kids and, you know, we do all four of them. And then I'm going through the the lunchroom and I'm, I'm high-fiving the kids as they're sitting down. And truth be told, just like Robbie Robinson says, people connect to your energy, not your talent. I probably gave a a C minus from a talent spo- uh, point uh, on that talk that day. But from an energy side of things, I gave an A plus and I did my best to try to connect with as many kids, you know, in and around and afterwards um, during that day. Even uh, the girl in the back in the blue, bright blue hair, I remember seeing her in the lunchroom and I remember going up to her and I was trying to make her laugh and she didn't laugh at all. And again, I was like, dang, you can, can't win them all. Right. But I tried, right. Gave the college try. And uh, over the next few weeks and few months, we kept delivering different versions of this talk, tweaking it here and there to, you know, try to make it better every time and everywhere we went. Um, And I remember uh, it was a few months later and um, I'm in my kitchen. It's nine o'clock at night and uh, I get a ding on my phone and I was like, whoa, that's not just a normal ding. That's an Instagram message ding, which is a a very important (laughs) ding. And so I get to my phone and I look and it's this longer message and I'm reading it. And in essence, it says, Hey, you were at my school a few weeks ago. I tried to direct message you, but it didn't work. So I'll try this. Hi, um, dot, dot, dot. You were, you know, you came to our school. Um, I heard the message. It didn't connect. I didn't like it. I didn't like you, but a few weeks later, I actually tried an act of courage. I sat in the lunchroom for the first time in a long time, which doesn't seem like a lot to you, but it is to me. And I ate and I kept it all down. Um, And then she wrote this final little piece that I'll never forget. She says, so dot, dot, dot. Thank you so much for existing. And I was like, wow, like who could this be? Right. As I'm going through all the different schools and I'm going through the different talks and I'm going through the different messages And I click on this girl's profile and the picture is this bright blue hair girl. It was her blue hair girl. (laughs) She was listening. She was paying attention. And maybe even if she wasn't, maybe it was the little extra connection that I made afterwards with her that really truly mattered. But either way, I got a message from her a few months after that talk that said things made sense and that she changed some of her behaviors and maybe found a little bit of hope and maybe believed in herself just a little bit more. Um, and so, yeah, that, that was a pretty profound moment in my, uh, in the last three years for sure. I hear a lot of, um, I'm looking for the right word generalizations, Joe, about air quotes, young people. And particularly, I I hear what I consider to be really tired and frankly, in my opinion, lazy rants about millennials. (laughs) I'm looking at your timeline of 15 years is almost a generation that you've you've turned over from talking to to younger people in school and, and whatnot. I'm curious about your perspective on what you see in terms of you know, not trying to label or classify people or say that they are a certain way or not because of whatever circumstances, but from the perspective of somebody that goes and has these both group and one-on-one experiences and has been doing so for long enough almost to turn over an entire generation, what do you see about these individuals, how they are, how they are not, and maybe why? It's a... Uh... Man, it's it's such a awesome perspective that you brought to the table, um, because I feel the same way. And in fact, we use the same actual adjective. It's laziness, right? It's just pure laziness to look at a generation of kids and say they're all like this or they're all like that. In fact, I have a quote um, that I want to share with you in the audience that I think really kind of sums up where we stand on this. And I just pulled it up right now as I'm on the internet. Um, it's, this is not even all of it. This is just half of it. But it says this. The children these days now love luxury. They have bad manners, contempt for authority, 
They show disrespect for elders and love to chatter in places of exercise. And you think, wow, what modern aged guru did a little bit of research on, you know, kids these days and, you know, made this quote. And then you realize who wrote it, Socrates. (laughs) So what you're telling me is that the kids these days are the exact same kids back in those days, which means we were the same kids, just like you were the same kids and our teachers were and our parents were. My point is kids are kids are kids are kids. And I think when we, we forget that we for, we and that's like another side note. Like we forget a lot about what it's like to be a kid. And so if there's anything we can have as adults, that's going to really make a connection with youth is empathy, remembering what it was like for us, because some of the things that we like say aren't that big of a deal because we know we're wiser, we're older, sure that boyfriend, sure that football game, sure that prom is at the end of the day, not that big of a deal. We forget how big of a deal it was when we were that age. And so I, I really struggle with this, like you said, tired, lazy approach of trying to point out a generations of quote unquote kids these days, and then just unloading this negative these negative stereotypes. Here, here's what I do see. I think being a kid these days in many respects is harder than it's ever been in the history of our world. And the stats actually prove it. The, the 160,000 kids these days will skip school because every day because they're afraid of how they're going to be treated because of being bullied. The average age of depression for kids these days is 14 and a half years old. 30 years ago, it was 28 and a half. It's been cut in half in less than 30 years. Uh, 5,400 youth between the ages of 12 to 18, the very definition of kids these days will attempt to commit suicide, not in a year, not in a month, every single day. And when I'm working with teachers, I say to them, I say, these are the kids that are walking into your classrooms every single day. And maybe just maybe you might be the one adult that has an opportunity to to be positive, to be that light in their life, to be the one person who reaches out to make a a, a real physical human connection, whether it's a pat on the shoulder, a high five, um, whether it's a half hug or whatever it may be. Those moments are so incredibly important. Um, So yeah, uh, I, I don't really see... Uh, a, a lot of differences in the last 15 years between the kids these days and the kids those days. What I do see is the fact that when you could get, when you got bullied 15 years ago, that, that, that probably stayed at the schoolyard and now it comes home with them every single moment of the day because of social media. Um, the kids 15 years ago weren't addicted. And I use that word very strategically. They weren't addicted to dopamine machines called cell phones that, you know, they didn't have that craving to go to that thing, to detach from other humans, to just get away from it all 24 seven. Simon Sinek talks a lot about kind of the poison that is the cell phone. And I look at it as almost like the, it's the new cigarette. And I, what I, what I say in many ways is that, you know, 39 years ago when my mom had me at the hospital, they told her to, to rest and relax and, her version of resting and relaxing 39 years ago was to light up an old gold 100 and smoke it right there in the maternity ward. And if somebody would have come up to her and told her to, to stop it, they would have been considered weird. It's not that we had bad doctors and it's not that we had bad nurses. It's just that we didn't know what we didn't know. 40 years you know, later, we look back and we say, that's crazy. You could smoke in a hospital. That's nuts. Like who would ever not know how bad that is for you. And I think the same thing is happening right now with the kids these days. I think 40 years from now, we're going to look back and, be, and go, you mean you, you gave them access to that all the time? And every time they hatched a new egg or made a new friend or got a new Instagram like, they got this little fake hit of happiness that was actually addictive. And so they couldn't help get more of that. And so they constantly are on their phones and they're constantly, you know, detaching from the people and the world around them because we're literally addicted to this little machine. And I just, I don't think we know what we know yet. And so being a kid these days in many respects is harder than it's ever been. And I think there's a real 
real like case to be made that the combination of cell phone addiction and just the riskiness of the behavior and the brain science that goes along with like where they're at as a teenager and all the different firing and wiring and thing that's going on, that combination is, I think they're going to look back and go, that was a pretty lethal and toxic combination. Um, yeah. So those be my thoughts on that. Well, it's interesting. I think anyway, Joe, that with all of this technology that's available to us today, I might argue that we've never been able to be more, how can I say it, um, readily in touch, if you will, yeah, yeah. Uh, and yet less connected at the same time. Yeah, I'm going to look up who said this because it's important that I get this right, but the phrase that I've heard is together alone. Does that ring true? Like, does that make sense? We're together, but we're we're alone, right? So it's not the same thing. Yeah, and I, I'm even just trying to think back about what some of the challenges may have been when you started what you were doing now and speaking to young people and talking about human connection. <laughs> I'm trying to think about how long ago it was that I started my first Facebook profile. And I remember this. I would have been in my 30s and people there, were, and I was a slow to adopt that. And I remember friends that had long since done so telling me, don't do it, don't do it, don't do yeah. it. It's it's going to be addictive. I remember the first Blackberries, which people called Crackberries. Yeah. Now, somebody would laugh at you if you showed them what one of those things looked like. And, and I guess what I'm getting at here, Joe, is that that mechanism of technology and the things that f that have this illusion of togetherness, but actually if you're not careful, can make you feel even more and more and more isolated. That challenge has um, has progressed at light speed directly into the crosshairs of the people that you're serving. That's That's got to be a constant sort of recalibration for you in terms of how you help people deal with that. Yeah, I think, I think it's, it's certainly not standing up on a stage and saying we're going to hell in a handbasket and these phones should all get thrown into the river. Like, obviously they're not going anywhere and technology in many ways has connected us better than it ever had. Like just FaceTime alone is an amazing example of how you can actually build connection, human connection through technology. I think we're, we, we struggle and what we can't forget is that, that that FaceTime connection will never ever replace a real-time connection. And that text message that you get will never replace a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And so it's in some respects, looking forward to the future and saying, yes, and bring it on. I want this technology because I know it's, A, I know it's happening and B, um, I think there are ways that we can attack it and use it in the right ways, but also keeping one foot into old fashioned land, <laughs> which to me is shaking a hand and looking someone in the eyes and having critical conversations that maybe are with people that you agree with. And maybe it's people that you disagree with, but all of that takes practice. It's not that somebody all of a sudden is bad at making, I hear teachers say to me that my kids, Kids these days, again, they, they can't make eye contact. And part of that is because they probably haven't gotten a lot of practice at making eye contact. And these sort of soft skills um, have real hard implications. And so I, I think it's that balance, right, of admitting the fact that, hey, we are moving forward at light speed. You're a part of it. I'm a part of it. We have no idea exactly where it's going, but let's be optimistic that we're going to be better tomorrow than we were today. But at the same time, let's not forget about what got us here in the first place. And that's human connection. 2000 years ago or 2,500 years ago, or however long ago when cavemen and Neanderthals are around and there are saber toothed tigers and about a million other things that are trying to vie for, you know, uh, king of the mountain, if you will, it was humans that made it to the top. And it's, primarily for a couple reasons. Number one, our brains were very good at figuring out when to fight and when to flight, when to freeze and when to stop. And 
we were also really profoundly good at this human connection thing. They had tribes of 200 people at max, or maybe 150, I think it is. And, and it was because they traveled in packs and it was because they used human connection to cooperate and move forward as a species. That's why we were able to be sitting here talking into computer screens right now. And as we move forward, I say yes to everything that's coming our way when it comes to new and fresh technology. But I also, again, feel it's critical that with my kids, I have three kids and they don't leave a target. They don't leave a restaurant. They don't leave a bank. They don't leave an ice cream man without looking them in the eyes and saying, thank you, or have a good day or shaking a hand or acknowledging the other person. Because I know as a, as a parent, that matters to me more than a test score. And it, I feel like that's the best way I can be serving my kids is giving them practice at real life human connection. And as I can't, I, I don't want to lose that. And I think that's my fear as we move forward with this technology. Of thinking big, Joe. I've read like the cliff notes version <laughs> it's of a, it, uh, but it, I haven't read the whole book. There's nothing particularly exclusive about it among the pantheon of, of personal growth and development books. It's just one that came along at a certain point in my life. When you're talking about your kids being out and, and, and having a kind word to say or, or speaking in appreciation or something like that. Here you're talking to a guy who hosts a podcast. He's got a background in radio broadcasting. You put me on a stage or behind a microphone and I'm fine, but very much, a, 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 a I guess a, an introverted extrovert, if you will, that when the, yeah. the lights are off, leave me alone. And when I read that book, it talked about forcing yourself to speak up, speak out, be a front seat or start conversations. And I got to a point, this is about, four or five years ago now, Joe, and I'm 43 at the time that we're having this conversation okay. where I had to force myself to do that. So some examples might be I'd been going to the same gym for a decade and over that amount of time, there are enough people that you just sort of pass by while you're both looking down and you never say anything to each other and you sort of feel like you should know each other, but you've lost your opportunities and now you're embarrassed to actually ask oh the gosh. other person what their name is, right? And I know that feeling very well. Yeah, so when you mention about your kids, like literally, Joe, I forced myself, a guy that's good on the mic and all of that stuff I just described – to start conversations with those people and I would and it would feel so awkward at first where I would say something like you know we've been coming here forever I'm embarrassed I feel like I should have said hi I'm Kevin it's good to meet you and then I'd sort of like brace for you know, someone to look at me like or whatever was coming next right yeah, yeah. I get that, right? and I would do this in the grocery store line and whatever I would just start talking to people and do you know what's ha you already know what, what happens every I, was gonna say, I can finish the sentence they're gonna go gosh thank god you're the you spoke up I've been wanting to say the same thing to you for the last seven years or their, whatever. their body language and their physiology yeah. changes oh, instantly it's instantly. just and it's sort of like and it's not even that it's me. It's just as a person, I'm being acknowledged and, and heard. And yet we live in this world of, you know, that being good morning and chipper and, and whatever else is almost goody two shoes. But you've seen, I mean, how close am I to, to touching on what you would consider real human connection? Well, I mean, 100%. Like that's, that's it. Like what, you I mean, like there's so many things that happened in that story with that gentleman that, I mean, if that, was that a true story? Did it actually come to fruition or you're saying you wish you would have? Oh no, that's, I could tell you, <laughs> we'll have to do parts two and three and four. I've done, <laughs> that's happened. It's become a way of life to the point where my kids started to ask me, Joe, why are you talking to that lady? Why are you talking to that man? Yeah. Yeah, and do I you would, know him? Do you I, know him? I, I get that all the time. How do you know him? I, I don't. Yeah, he's there. Oh. He's yeah. human. I'm human. We're both waiting in the same grocery store line. We can sit here and grumble and look at our phones or we can talk yeah. to each other. And what happens is that you have these extraordinary moments of just presence and mindfulness and, and being in the moment and having it occur to you that you're completely happy simply for existing. It almost sounds too simple. And yet it's sitting right there in front of us, but we miss it because we're looking for something else. Yeah, it's it, man. It's just like, well, and I think too, it, it, it's it's not even that we're looking for something else as much as it's it's the fear that you were talking about of rejection. Like, 
what if that seven, that guy that you've been walking for the last seven years, maybe he's just not wanted to talk to you. So maybe he says he grumbles or he like talks under his breath or he doesn't even acknowledge you. And you're like, man, you know, like that, that sucks. And it's hard to step outside of your comfort zone and, and do exactly what it is that you're saying to do. It's really hard. You said you had to like force yourself in a way to do it. Yep. What's easy is to look down and play a game of candy crush. And so if I have to choose between, if my brain has to choose between doing what's easy and doing what's hard, I'm going to automatically do what's easy nine times out of 10. It's only when I actually am an intentional and sort of tell myself, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do this thing that my brain is telling me is harder for me to do that, you know, we step outside our comfort zone. And, and I think that's part of the reason why we're losing it. It's, it's not that we don't think it's important. It's just that it's, it's challenging and it's a lot easier just to, to not connect than it is to connect. It's a lot easier when I'm on an airplane traveling to a school for me to just hope that the person sitting next to me doesn't make that awkward eye contact so that I then have to ask questions about their life. It's way easier if I just check out. But then, like you said, I'm sure there's, again, episode two, three, and four, where we could talk about all of those amazing conversations that we would have never had if that person didn't make eye contact with us. And what we sort of know, and I think what science is proving more and more, is that those moments of connection were hardwired for them. That's why that physiology thing changed, I think. It's because there's something that happens within our entire body that craves that human connection. And when we actually get it, it's like something changes in us. Like we feel different. When I walk off a plane and I had a meaningful conversation with somebody uh, from Chicago to Minneapolis, I walk off that plane feeling better than I would have if I literally would have just stayed on my phone the whole time. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I, it's, it's exactly what you're saying. That is the human connection we're talking about. It isn't that hard. It's simple things. It's high fives. It's handshakes. It's noticing somebody and saying, I see you, brother. I see you, sister. It doesn't have to be a lot. But because we're so hungry for that, I think that's, you know, that's why that physiology happens. And that's why I think people are so receptive to it once it's presented. But it's hard. So, yeah. It's so easy to assume that, that we know what's going on with, with other people. And you've outlined a number of examples of, of how we might not. You're the guy that comes in and, and tries to shine that light for other people and encourage the connection. But you're human too, Joe. And so I'm curious about what comes to mind, if anything does, of a time where, for whatever reason you might have questioned your own mission. Oh my gosh. Again, that might be episode six, seven, and eight. Um, every, not every day, but like uh, for the last three years, there was plenty of, plenty of nights of me looking at the computer screen blank going, what the hell am I doing? Who are you? Who, who, who do you think you are to literally do? You look like you're 15 years old. You have a backwards hat. There's no way anyone's going to pay attention to what you have to say. Um, and all you got to do is look at your bank statement to prove that to be true. And I'd look at the bank statement and I'd go, how am I going to pay my mortgage this month? H how am I going to make it work with three kids and wife? Um, how are we going to do this? And so there was plenty of times. Uh, and it's a, it's a lonely job too, because it's not like, I can talk to my wife about it. She's already supported me jumping out on my own. The last thing I want to tell her is, hey, I don't think I can do this thing that you said yes for me to, you were skeptical of in general, but you supported. Um, and so, it, yeah, there's lots of moments of conversation of what are you doing and what are you thinking? And, but I knew that going into it too. I knew that was going to be there. I was prepped for it. And so I, I continued to fight and I continued to just keep pushing forward and I would find these little wins, whether it was giving a C minus content speech in Sun Prairie, Wisconsin, but having kids still high five me afterwards. And I'd go, okay, well, it was at least better than math, right? So, okay. So we can, if we can just be at least better than math, then maybe we can continue this. And I would just take these little wins and I would build on those. 
And I would really try as hard as I possibly could to put more time and energy and focus on the wins than the losses. But um, yeah, those losses are real and the stress is real. And uh, yeah, it's all real, man. What do you consider to be the biggest challenge that you, based on your experience, you may have to face when you get in front of a, a new group of people? Um, the biggest challenge that I have when I'm in front of a new group of people, I think for it's, it kind of depends on the audience. I think for adults, when I'm speaking to them, my biggest thing I have to overcome and, and I do it pretty quickly is the fact that I, again, look like I'm 15 years old. Um, and there are plenty of teachers who have been doing this a heck of a lot longer than I have. Not to mention, I don't have classroom experience. So who is this young buck coming in to try to tell me how to do my job better than I can do it, even though I've been doing it a lot longer? And, and by the way, he has no experience in the what, in the what I do. Um, so there, that, that's, that's in my head a lot. And so I have to quickly win them over. Um, and I, I do that. I do that, A, through human connection. Um, I do some quick little icebreaker stuff that's, low risk enough that even the crustiest like Phi Ed teacher in the back of the room will do. Um, and then I tell a story and the story that I share is a very, very impactful and a very, very empowering story. Um, and storytelling is such an important way to win over a human brain. And you get a lot of those negative thoughts to shut up when you tell a story because people start putting themselves in the story they see themselves as the characters and there's just something about a story that just genuinely connects with the human brain and it allows for those negative i think skepticisms and voices in their head of you know who is this kid trying to tell me it it goes away um or at least lightens a lot and then i generally would say like I know what you're thinking right now after I tell the story, who's this young kid who looks like he's 15 years old. I like basically call it out. And I say here, I'm not here today to try to tell you how to do your job better. I'm here today to talk about what's one of the most critical things that kids need to have. And that's human connection. Um, and so I talk about that and I lean into that, but, um, for par- or for adults, that's, that's one of my biggest fears, if that makes sense. Yeah, it absolutely does. I'm, I find myself wanting to ask you about maybe a time where you found yourself in a situation where, for whatever reason, Joe, you were surprised by something or perhaps learned something or acquired a deeper learning of something that you'd already been exposed to through that experience. Yeah. um, I was, earlier this year, I was in Iowa and... A young girl came up to me afterwards and she um, shared with me a pretty heavy story about how her boyfriend um, had raped her and um, the boyfriend still goes to school in the same school she goes to and she sees him every day and you know, she's crying as she's telling me this and I'm sitting there and I'm crying as I'm hearing it and I just start talking and I just start trying to like make it all go away. And I just can't stop talking. And I realized that at the end of me talking for what was way longer than I should have, she had this like glossy eyed look and I didn't know what to say. And I didn't know what to do. And she just like turned and she walked away. And it was this moment of like, Oh my gosh, this girl just shared such an important moment with me. And I didn't know how to handle it. I thought the best thing I could do in that moment was like talk my way into a solution. And what I ended up doing was just talking myself into circles. And what I should have done is I should have walked that girl all the way into the counselor's office. And I should have put a hand on her back and her shoulder. And I should have said, we're going to go right now. And I'm going to talk. And I should have talked to her and just like told her what we were doing. I should have just walked her down there and I should have, you know, done that. And and maybe even more importantly, I should have just stopped talking. <laughs> I should have just listened and I should have just said, or maybe even asked questions about, you know, um, how she's feeling now or what are some things that she could be doing to cope or whatever, like just explored a little bit more. 
but I ended up talking and talking and talking and talking. And I feel like I, I missed out on a moment that was really, really important. And even though I did follow up with her counselor and teacher and principal and said, Hey, make sure she, you know, gets the help that she needs. Um, I feel like I, I missed out on an opportunity right there. And it's because I was just talking, talking, talking. That's come up. You'll, you won't be surprised to learn Joe on this podcast before. And quite recently, as a matter of fact, yeah. well, and that goes to, it, it feeds into the beast that we were talking about earlier, I think, doesn't it? Of We seem to be programmed more on transmit than receive. You know, with yeah. social media and everything else, we're, we're broadcasting out our highlights, but don't, I, and my hand is raised as uh, guilty, if you want to use that word, and it's something that I actually affirm and write down every day about about listening. And that gets back to that just giving somebody a space to be heard. That's come up a couple times between us, I guess. Yeah, that's interesting. There's a, a family friend of ours who um, unfortunately passed away a few years ago. His name was Moose, and he had a great quote. And he said, be more interested than interesting. Hmm. And I've I've always kept that in the back of my mind. And um, that day I was, I was more interesting than interested. And uh, it didn't obviously produce the best result. And so I've, I, I keep that there. And I, I talk to my kids about that and just try my best to, to really listen and be in, more interested than interesting. At what point along the way did you define what you were passionate about, what your mission was as human connection? That actually is a, Again, again, I think all of this is part of the journey and part of the story, right? So I'd be like, gosh, it's such a great, great question because there's such a great story that goes around it. And But it's the same story as I'm guessing most entrepreneurs. You, you throw it all on the wall and you see what sticks. Hmm. And we kept throwing and kept throwing and kept throwing. And we would write these talks and throw them in the fire and rewrite them and throw them in the fire and rewrite them. And we were trying to figure out you know, who we were, were we, stu- were, t- were we talking to students? Were we talking to adults? Were we talking to parents? Was our message on A, B, C, or D? And it was a real big struggle. And it was part of the reason I was so stressed. And part of the reason that I don't think we ever really truly could move forward as a business, because we really didn't stand for anything. We were kind of trying to be everything to everyone. And uh, it just doesn't work. And so through a lot of discernment, a lot of, again, throwing it all on the wall and just trying it and and stumbling and failing and getting back up and doing it all over again. What we realized is that our superpower is our ability to connect. And when I say us, I have a business partner who um, has an amazing ability to connect with people. And when we would go to these conferences of adults who had much more experience in this field of education than we ever had. We would walk away and people would be loving us. Again, it wasn't because of our talent. It was because of our energy. And after a while, again, it takes sometimes a long time for me to understand what's kind of clear and obvious in the moment. I realized that that's the thing that I am really bad at about a hundred million things. But the one thing I am good at is connecting with people. It's just the thing that Patsy said when I was five years old. That's the one stinking thing that I've ever been good at. And it just so happens to be the one stinking thing that every kid in this world needs. Needs, not wants, not wishes, not hopes, needs. We need it. And so, and it just so happens that we're in dire need of it, right? With the cell phone age and the technology. And so it's like, boom, that. A, this is what I'm good at. B, this is what kids need. And C, this is a huge pain point that schools across the country and across the world are dealing with right now. And so when we started talking about human connection and just when people would say, so what do you speak about? And we started using that language. You could see people starting to nod their head and get on board. And it was like, okay, this is it. And so then we just started piling on like what are some ways that we build human connection and it was things that we didn't even think about it's the fact that when kids come into an auditorium that i'm speaking in i have music playing and i do some silly icebreakers and i do x y and z and i'm real and i'm vulnerable 
And I share like the times in my life, not when I knock it out of the park, but when I messed up and when things got, you know, met, when I screwed up basically. And I talk about that and it's like, oh yeah, tell other people that. The, n- other people need to know that. And so our talk and this message, especially again with adults, um, has really been born out of throwing everything on the wall, seeing what sticks, but then also realizing like, no, I do have a superpower here. And no, I might not have 40 years of teaching experience, but nobody can connect with kids better than I can. Like, or I shouldn't say it like that sounds egotistical, but I'm good at what I do. And I can share how I do that basically. Um, And so, yeah, like that's kind of how it was born and, and how it's continuing to move forward. I love what you said about just getting in there and, you know, sort of failing forward and what I would call finding your voice. I get really frustrated when I I hear, and, and maybe it's just because of the circles that I run in and the content that I, I tend to consume and, and look for, Joe, but I, I keep hearing about find your niche, target your audience, develop your avatar, find the, you know, what's the problem that you solve and deliver the solution. And that's all well and fine. And it's not bad advice from a sales and marketing perspective. But what I can say to that is I had a number of times in my life where I approached something with that formula, thinking that I could do something to get an expected result but that I would find only after putting so much of my blood, sweat, and tears into it over a period of months or years in most cases, that that did not align with who I really was. And so in order to find that path of of, of authenticity, sometimes you've got to get into the, <laughs> you know, you've got to just jump into the pool and start flapping your arms and the way will show itself to you. But a lot of times you can't really find that authentic voice sitting on the sidelines and crafting a business plan. Tell me if you think I'm wrong. You are, I am like, we are brothers from another mother, my friend. Like I am not in my head. I'm doing a little dance. I'm smiling at the screen. Yes, yes. And yes. And what I thought of as you were talking about it, you know, like think about a time where we had an expected outcome in our head and it turned out differently. Yeah. That's called college. <laughs> yeah. 95% of my friends who went in knowing what they were going to be when they left were something different at the end of those four years, right? Like uh, we have to experience the experience before we, I think many times can know what it is that the end result's going to be. And I, I felt that same frustration again, like it sounds so easy, just find your niche and go all in and do that. But at the end of the day, what they're not saying or what's not like being talked about is, some of that can't be discovered until you actually get out there and do the work. And so, yeah, I mean, I'm a believer in what you're speaking about. And uh, yeah, I, uh, I, that is, I, I, for better or for worse, uh, I am a jump in the pool and start flapping my arms kind of a guy. And there's been plenty of times where that's gotten me into trouble. Plenty of times we, again, episode nine or 10, where I can, <laughs> share a story where I walked into a bathroom and splashed water on my face because I was in that mode of like, Oh crap, I don't know how I'm going to get through these next, this next hour. I stepped in way in over my head on this one. Um, but at the end of the day, I, I needed to do that. I needed to flap my wings. I needed to screw up or, you know, splash water in my face. I needed to have that moment um, in order to see the bigger picture for me. And you're still here. And here, man. <laughs> so yeah. I can't see you at the moment, but I'm imagining both your arms are still attached despite yeah. all that flapping. Tell me about a little bit more of the, of the bigger picture uh, in as much as, as it's showing itself to you at, at this point where we're talking today, Joe. What, um, what are some of the things that are sort of in your heart and spirit that you, you might like to see as you take this journey forward? For me, and this speaks to the just the human of – uh, uh, the human side of me, uh, the business side of me, the performer side of me, the inspired for me, um, it's figuring out a way to scale this message. Um, it's amazing to be live on a stage in front of a group of people. I will never, ever stop doing that. Um, but I have three kids from ages 11, seven and five and a wife who works 45 to 50 hours a week in downtown Minneapolis. That's 30 to 40 minutes from our house. Um, Every time I get on a plane, there's a lot of different spinning plates that start going. And uh, 
there's a lot of things I miss and there's a lot of things that, um, yeah, I sacrifice. And so figuring out how to do this work, share the message, but also be an awesome dad and an awesome husband and to experience my life and enjoy that and to really be present for it, figuring out how to scale it and what that looks like for us specifically um, is we're in the process of creating right now what in essence is going to be the Netflix for student character work. It's called the Human Connection Hub, and it's going to be an online platform where teachers or parents or principals or any human who wants to have stronger connections with youth um, can go and they can you know, watch three to five minute student character videos. That could be a great thing for a teacher to play in a classroom. It could be an interview with somebody like yourself um, or somebody who is an expert in the education field and saying, hey, I want to pick your brain about a certain subject or maybe it's a parenting expert. And I say to them, what is like the deal with teenagers and how do we get them to get out of bed in the morning? And they go, oh yeah, it's these three things right here. So we want to create resources that the entire village, parents, students, and educators can benefit from all around the power of human connection. And we want to create it in an on-demand sort of subscription-based platform like a Netflix. Um, and that, to me, is how we scale this thing. And uh, I believe there's a real need for it. I believe schools are hungry for short, bite-sized versions of character that they can play, again, on-demand. And I think parents are as well. And so... Um, it's, uh, it's, you know, all coming together right now. It's not something that we've officially launched, but we are going to, uh, slowly roll it out in the next few months and then fully launch it in August. Joe, I wish you well like that. Please consider this an, an open invitation to come back here and, and explore that and share about that further with another episode and to tell some some of these other stories yeah. that I, I know that we both have, but what a pleasure it is. You know, we talked about technology and, um, and energy you've mentioned and you and I chatted just a little bit before we we clicked record on this conversation about how we even found each other and how you can sort of sense somebody's vibe and energy even though you're in different geographies and even through the technology and every time I'm having a conversation like this with someone like you I'm just shaking my head at, at thinking how magical it can be that people like us are finding each other and connecting and sharing stories and how humbling it is to think that this goes out into the ether and who knows who it might help and, and when and, and where. Um, but I can't do this alone. It's my show, but it's not about me, which means I need you. And uh, and that means I have to ask for your most valuable resource, which is your time, which you've generously given today. So thank you for all of that. Good luck with everything. And keep me in the loop so we can uh, we can follow up and do a part two and however many more if you're game. Kevin Bulmer, I uh, I am in on all of that. Uh, I will keep you posted whether you like it or not. You might hear from me more than you want, but uh, it's like, man, Kevin likes me. He cares. I'm gonna I'm gonna share as much with him as much as I can. Uh, I feel honored to be on the podcast. I'll continue to keep you updated, and and hopefully uh, there is an episode two, and maybe a three in our past. We'll hopefully cross in in real life someday. But uh, it's been an honor and a pleasure, and I appreciate appreciate the great conversation. If you'd like to connect with Joe and learn more about his work, the easiest place to find him is on his website, joebeckman.com, just like it sounds. J-O-E, and Beckman is B-E-C-K-M-A-N, joebeckman.com. You can find the links to all his social media outlets there as well. You can find Joe on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. I'll also post those links on the show notes blog post for this episode, which is number 74 at noschedulemanpodcast.com. If you like this episode with Joe, I'm pretty sure that you're going to like episode 72 from a couple of weeks ago with Pauline Duncan Thrasher. It's called Speaking Your Truth. And I think it's sort of an interesting compliment to what Joe was talking about of reclaiming human connection and really getting in touch with yourself and with each other. Pauline's story is a really good example of what happens if you don't do that for the first part of your life, but how that can still be reclaimed. A really thought-provoking episode. It's number 72. And then going all the way back to episode 14 and episode 13. So episode 14 was Sarah Westbrook. 
And that is talking about owning your choices. Now, Sarah is like Joe, somebody who goes and speaks to students and really has her finger sort of on the pulse of where their thoughts and feelings are. And that was a, a really powerful episode, number 14, near the beginning of this podcast. I would encourage you to go back and listen to that. And also episode 13 with Andy Thibodeau, who also speaks to a lot of post-secondary students, student leadership groups, and people of that nature. It's called Dig In, Dare to Care with Andy Thibodeau, episode number 13. Now you can find those and all past episodes of this podcast around the world on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, and at noschedulemanpodcast.com. If you're in the United States, you can also access the show on the U.S. feed of iHeartRadio and Google Play Music. If you'd like to connect with me, I'd love to get a note from you. Just look for, for No Schedule Man. That's my handle on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter. Or visit me at kevinbulmer.com and sign up for my email list to keep in touch. Also, just a reminder to be a part of my exclusive online community, visit me at theturtletribe.com. We'd love to have you. Thanks so much for taking the time to listen. If you found this helpful, please make sure to subscribe and tell a friend. I hope to have you here again for the next episode of Journeys with the No Schedule Man. Just a little deja vu.